Today, I'm gonna be showing you guys how I recreated the track Scarlet by Holly Humberstone. We're gonna dive into some vintage drum sample stuff, how to get the track's main key sound, and explore sort of nostalgic 90s sound design approach. But before we jump into any of that, let me introduce myself. Hi, my name is Seth. I produce music under the name Velvet Ear. I do one of these videos every Friday, showing people how to produce their own indie pop at home. Songs I've either written or produced have been featured on these Spotify curated playlists, and I did an entire album through Warner Music Group. So if you watch this video and it seems like we would have fun working on a project together, check out the top link in the description. All right, now onto the rest of the track. So there's definitely a lot of layers to go through. So actually the first one I wanna go over is this guy. I call it like a VHS style lead from the intro. But yeah, I just found a preset in uh, Analog Lab, which I've been having a lot of fun with. Sort of this like arpeggiated thing to get this sort of nostalgic 80s vibe in the first few seconds, which little bits of ear candy like this actually help a lot when you're trying to create almost, I want to say like the lore of what the song is supposed to sound like. The way I always describe it to people is almost try to come up with like a gorillas style comic book version of the story you're trying to tell and try to get that in an auditory way because that can really help a listener envision what you're trying to get them to envision. After that, we have the main keys sound. Which if I were to describe it as accurately as I could in terms of guessing what she used, I'm assuming that it's some kind of Yamaha DX7 patch. I couldn't find one that sounded exactly like it, but I did use this uh, Dire Dire DX preset in Anna 2 and layered it up with a couple of other Anna patches. This one that has a little bit more of a sort of a Tyne attack to it. And then this organ preset to sort of beef up the mid range. And I'm doing all this because when I'm recreating a patch, I'm one of those people that doesn't really care about recreating the sound perfectly. I think it's a lot more useful to describe the aspects of that patch that you like and then go, okay, how do I recreate those different aspects? So when I listened to the original patch, I went looking through all of my DX7 style presets and I couldn't really find anything that sounded exactly like it. So instead what I did was I dissected the things from the sound that I wanted to hit. I wanted to get that sort of cheesy 80s keys sound, which I got from this guy. After that, I knew I wanted to get some kind of dusty sort of Tyne style piano attack, which I'm getting from this guy. And then after I got these two together, I knew I wanted something that had that sort of filler mid-range aspect to it, which I got from this guy. So when you put all of them together, Again, doesn't sound exactly like the original patch, but if you're in a situation where you're not really that concerned about getting the exact same sound, I feel like this is a pretty useful approach to getting something in the ballpark. I wanted to bring out some of the grit, so used some SBL twin tube, and this mainly came at the end of the process when I was using my reference mix and I felt like there was just not a lot of mid-range in a lot of the elements, so you'll see this guy a lot. Because if I'm trying to like bring out that sort of honky mid-range, but I don't want to like like boost it on the actual master. I'll go through my mid-range elements and add some saturation or some EQ boost. And this SPL is kind of the cleanest saturator that I have, which sometimes isn't necessarily what you want. I also used some other ones that weren't as clean as this one. But if literally all you are looking for is the harmonic excitement, this is a great option. Some compression to the kick, which most of the tracks are. And then I high-passed it. I think probably one of the biggest reasons that I'm high-passing stuff when I'm doing indie pop is this sort of like 150 hertz range. It's sort of like the trans transition point between the higher fundamentals of low end and mid range. And this is where you get a lot of warmth. And so you're constantly in this battle with all these mid range elements like guitars and keys of like how much of that do you let in? So I find that high passing stuff can normally negate a lot of the sort of mid range cuts that you would have to do. Although sometimes you do just need to do like a cut here if you have a lot of different elements that are in that range. Any way that you can sort of differentiate the layers. Like even with the twin tube, I was going through and accentuating different harmonics depending on what instrument I was putting this plugin on just so I could have those harmonics sort of like boosting in different areas and they weren't all just sort of like in this 10K range. And then I think the only other element here is when we get to the chorus, this section is kind of based off of the, we get this low piano here. 
here, why don't we try something? Here, just so you guys can see what I'm seeing here, I'm gonna add my decibel meter over here because this one's really important. You can see that they were kind of boosting here in that sort of like 300, 350 range. And I felt like that was sort of the main reason to add these keys in these giant chords of like synths in very smooth sounding stuff. We have some realistic style piano, just playing some really low chords with a fifth occasionally just to add that sort of like chonk to it. And you really feel it when it's not there. I actually processed this pretty heavily just because I wasn't really trying to get that sort of like subby low end with the piano, which I would say is the main danger you run into when you're using realistic pianos in that lower octave since pianos were created to sort of be played by themselves. They really take up the frequency range. So like right here, look at the graph in the corner. Now, if I disable the high pass filter on the group, Like you can see stuff's popping up as low as like 40 Hertz. And so we just want to make sure we're cleaning that up. So yeah, there's any one tip that I would give to people who are using real piano sounds in their modern pop productions. It's that if you are using really low octave pianos, you really need to watch that low end because it can suck up everything else. But yeah, that guy is going to a reverb, which another thing that we can talk about, we're using this reverb here on Ascend. We have this ROM reverb here on B. And what I felt like is when the chorus dropped, things were getting a bit muddy in the mid-range and so another thing that i did here on the actual send was i used uh, a multi-band compressor on the actual reverb so we go into our reverb and then our multi-band compression after that because in these genres where there is a lot of like mid-range elements when you have multiple things going to a reverb and they're all kind of mid-range focused it can kind of ring out in the reverb a bit longer which can kind of make things feel a little bit which can kind of obfuscate things so over here if i just solo this send Like watch this band here that's like kind of centered around 2K. When those higher synths come in, it triggers that range a little bit more. So it's sort of dynamically pulling these mid-range frequencies down. And I prefer that as opposed to just doing like a straight cut, because with that straight cut, you're just kind of decreasing the volume of the frequency as a whole. Whereas now, whenever that element isn't playing, that sort of higher lead element isn't triggering the reverb in that way, then those frequencies aren't being pulled down. So you get a lot more fullness. But yeah, this is another way to mellow out your mid-range a bit. So now let's look at the Junos real quick that come up in the chorus. Very simple. We're in D, so we're just kind of pedaling on the root, also playing this melody. Have it in a couple of octaves. Using a Tal Uno, which I recently got again, and I forgot how much I love this guy. This is actually the Juno plugin that I would recommend starting out with if you've never gotten into a Juno before. It's like 60 bucks, and it's uh, genuinely like one that I'm using all the time. I actually made a hotkey on my stream deck to bring it up in Ableton because I'm using it all the time. I will say one downside of this plugin is that the presets that it ships with are not that great and they do have some that you can install on their website for free but i would highly recommend the two packs that are on reverb machine they have them for this but yeah just a very simple envelope juno i'm normally finding that with these patches i'm normally adjusting the attack because that's where a lot of the, the sort of rolling character of a juno comes from it's either adjusting the attack turning it to envelope and then adjusting how much of the envelope and the filter is being applied and then where that frequency starts so frequency envelope and attack and then this switch are normally the things that I'm adjusting. After that, we go through our pads, which sound like this. You guys know me, so we have everything split into layers. So the first one we have is, again, the Tal Uno, just playing a very basic Juno patch. Almost that sort of cheesy 80s laser grid sound. And we're playing a uh, root and a fifth because that's very neutral sounding. Underneath that, we have an instance of Arcade on the acoustic textures. I've used this guy for a bunch. This first key tuned up an octave from what it normally is. And then band passing stuff just because it's a bit too much when you let it go straight through. So if I turn off the EQ. It's like really wide and awesome, but to sort of focus in a bit more on the frequency range that we want. And then underneath that, we have another instance of Arcade. 
I think it's also from Acoustic Textures, but we're doing one of these higher notes up here. And I just added that in because I felt like there was a little bit of like a, a violin string in the background of the pads in the original track. But yeah, all these guys are meant to sort of be oral excitement stuff that's sort of playing with the stereo field, but also giving that mid-range presence. To sort of balance them out tonally, I have them going pretty heavy into Moti T almost using it as a limiter at this point because it just kind of slams it with this very overbearing multi-band compression that you can sort of dial in pulling back the highs and stuff like that and then these guys were sounding a little bit too clean and so instead of using the spl twin tubes i actually used the soft tube saturation knob which is still like in my opinion one of the best free plugins you can get because it just gives that awesome hyper distorted sound so if i just crank it you can hear It's like the perfect characteristic of like analog distortion without being overbearing. You can focus the saturation on either the low end or the high end. Very practical. I use it all the time. And this is a great example of when I am using one saturation over another. I'm not just blindly picking one and saying I'm using this one. It's because I've used these plugins in a bunch of different productions and I've found that they excel best at different tasks. So for these pads, they were cleaner and I wanted them to be dirtier. And I used a saturator that made them grungier. Whereas previously I had keys that I wanted to make more present, but not necessarily dirty. So I use the SPL. So like when you're picking plugins and stuff like that, it's important to keep in mind what you are trying to achieve so that you can address the tools that you have and how to get there. Now we have the guitars layer. <laughs> So we have these guys down here that are just doing basic strum chords, giving it sort of like a rolling motion on those chord changes. I was actually trying to be specifically not on time with these. You can see here on the downbeat, I'm actually kind of like rolling into the chord a little bit before that. And that's because when you're playing guitar stuff, the higher strings tend to actually be when people feel like the downbeat. So bang. Like that higher brain tends to actually be when people perceive the one. So if you want to get this sort of rolling motion, you can sort of go through the lower strings and have the higher strings be closer to the actual one instead of starting the chord on the one because then the higher strings are going to sort of roll in here. And honestly, when I'm doing a lot of takes of guitar, that's the thing that I'm trying to get is not actually like a perfect like on the grid performance, but actually but getting the vibe of the performance that I want, which I feel like is sometimes more important than actually like playing on the grid. Unless you're doing stuff like these melody lines up here, which are just straight up quantized on the grid. <laughs> because those are really sharp parts. They're a melody line, they're not a chord. It's actually important to get those on the grid. Otherwise, it just sounds audibly off. But yeah, so for these chordal guys down here, we're using guitar rigs, uh, the Prince in the Rain preset with the reverb turned off. Patch is mainly based around a Roland Jazz Chorus amp. It's a very clean, very 80s-esque. For both of these lines, I used my Strat. And then for these guys up here, I also use guitar rig, but I use the uh, Andy in a Bottle preset. So this is more of a Marshall patch that's a bit drivier, which if I had to distill guitar patch basics, it would be that if you want something to stand out a bit more, that's normally going to be something like a lead. You want it to have more harmonic detail. And in guitar player world, more harmonic detail tends to be either changing to a bridge pickup, playing more aggressively, or just playing through a patch that has a bit more gain. But I mean, at the same time, when you listen to this patch, it's not like it has significantly more gain than the the other one it just kind of has like a bit of a buzzing to it which is mainly coming from a saturation knob after it that's focused more on like high-end detail these relatively are clean compared to these guys again we're just sort of cutting out that low end and shaping that mid-range so that it doesn't really interfere with anything else all this low mid and mid-range cutting becomes really important when you have vocals because if all of this is out of whack there's almost like no room for a vocal to compete with it and you might end up doing stuff like boosting your mid-range on your vocal too much or over compressing it trying to get it on top of this beat that is just filled with frequencies. Next thing we're gonna look at are the basses. which actually I might try to add another display for you guys just to see. Here, I just, I'm sorry. It's just, I have decibel set up on a separate monitor now. And it's just, it's very practical to show people what things are looking like. So. 
you can see things whipping out here a bit, but pretty much anything below this like 70 hertz range is pretty darn mono. And I found that that's really important with getting these bases to like hit hard, you know, with this sort of like 80s laser beam style synth wave bass. Everybody loves talking about like the low end and how big the low end is. But a lot of these guys kind of struggle to peek out on top of mixes when you don't layer them properly and you don't mix them properly. So right now we have three layers. We have this guy here, which I think was the first one I started out with which is just like a pure subby patch inside of Tal. After that, we got this guy. You can see that there's a lot of like harmonics happening here, but it doesn't have that same like subby low end that we need. Like it's more texture than actual like subby low end with this upper layer. Like you can see, it almost has more of like a peak in those like subby fundamentals than the actual like lower patch. And so when you combine all of them together, you get the best of both worlds where you are getting that lower fundamental, but then an upper harmonic that really peaks out over the mix and it reaches low enough to be in that subby low end, but there's enough texture up here in the upper mid range to where it just, it feels right. Also, if I take out this upper one and we look at like how wide it is in the stereo field. Not bad, turn it on. You can just see like the meat of it just getting wider. And that's because A, it's pretty present in the mix, but also what I did was I went into this towel patch and I turned off the Juno chorus, brought in some polyverse wider, and then added the towel chorus after it, which is actually a separate plugin that you can get for free. So like it's even wider and thicker going into it. So this guy. It's just super thick, super wide. It's more of like a textural thing. And we're not even relying for it to provide that subby low end. Just did like some basic EQ with Pro-Q on the bus. When I'm trying to bring multiple bass patches together, I'm normally adding a little bit of saturation just because I've found almost similar to drum samples when you're like blending samples on top of a real kit. Adding a little bit of saturation can kind of make them not sound like a bunch of different patches going together. Then we have MoTT, again, sort of acting as a limiter and sort of bringing out the press of everything compressor brought to the kick and then a bit of track spacer focused on the low end so it's pulling this sort of 50 hertz range out of the bass every time the kick hits which again just kind of makes the low end a little bit cleaner and all of it results in this bass that is really thick really subby in the low end brings all this like wide mid-range and aggressiveness to the track but it doesn't step on top of the kick which is a really fine balance because with a lot of people the things that they use to bring out sort of this like synth wave style bass in my opinion it normally tends to veer on making the bass too big to the point where it then just kind of swallows the kick drum and then finally we get to a pretty simple drum track so i think one of the main contributors to the drum sound here is the lin drum stuff which for anyone who doesn't know lin drums refers to the lin drum machine it was this guy here it was very popular in the 80s and it was one of the first sort of like 80s sample modules that allowed you to track your own drum samples into it if you want to hear examples of like actual like lin drum stuff i would check out don't come around here no more by tom petty so yeah recently i bought a large pack of samples and presets from Reverb Machine, which I mainly got for like their Archuria samples. But since I was in Ableton, it also came with this sort of like Lin drum drum rack. And so for this track, I just ended up using it a lot. So the first one we have here is the hi-hat, which... I just kind of got lazy and instead of like typing in a bunch of MIDI, I just held down one note, as you can see by this big black bar, and then just added an arpeggiator as a MIDI effect. And we're just holding out on this one note. One thing you have to be careful about with these sort of like vintage -y samples or even just like regular hi-hat samples, I find is that they can tend to be kind of annoying sounding when you layer them up with everything else. So my preferred way of handling that is to tune hi-hats specifically to the key of the song. And I'll show you how I do that. I just open up something like like Pro-Q, and I'll just hit play and hover my mouse here. 
And as you can see, it's, it's sort of taken the spectrum, held it for a few seconds to see where the peaks in the resonance are. And I can actually go here and see that it is a D5, which we're in the key of D. Again, this is not like perfect, but if it was something like a G sharp, I might tune it up a semitone so that it's an A, because when it's a D to a G sharp, that's a tritone. And when it's a D to an A, that's a perfect fifth, which just kind of sounds a little bit nicer. And so, yeah, you're not always going to get like a clean result looking for it, but it's just something to keep in mind and something to look at. So as you can see, I like tuned it up a bit so that the sample was actually a bit higher than it originally was. And something interesting about this hi-hat, it's not just Lindrum in sound, it's Lindrum in sort of like arrangement. Like it's a very drum machine-y style beat where it's just like bap, 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 bap. So the arpeggiator was also a reason to go for that. After that, I am also using a Lindrum kick here. Like you can see like these 80s samples, they actually have a bit of, they have a bit of spice to them. Like I'm doing some processing here, but if I take it off, like at its root, that's just a solid kick drum, even though it's from like almost 40 years ago. But yeah, again, just tuned it to make sure that it was kind of close-ish to the fundamental of the song. Just really quickly used some BX Boom. It's really good at sort of finding like the things that people tend to like about kick drums and just making it a one-knob solution. A little bit of max bass to sort of bring it into that sort of like sub or low-end world. And then just the tiniest bit of harmonics here just to get like that like 6K, just to kind of like poke out a little bit. And then as I said, most of the elements in the track are being sidechained to this only by like a db or so didn't really want that super pumpy flavor and then after that we have our snare drum which is not a lindrum sample we're just using this leno smack snare just boosting a little bit around like 130 just to give it a little bit more throatiness i threw a hoss effect on the snare drum just because when i was listening to the reference track it sounded like there was something weird on the snare added some spl on a different frequency range and then threw it into our good and old non-linear reverb on ascend just to get that sort of like 80 sort of like ah, after it hits and then some clap impact and then I know I said that I was going to stop doing like mastering stuff in these videos, but with this one, it just, it felt like the mastering chain or at least the two bus processing, it was just so vital to the sound. So just real quickly, as you can see, I made all of the bass mono below 80 Hertz, used a little bit of soothe. I've just set it to be like this Josh Goodwin preset by default, and then I'll like tweak it if I feel like I need it. Using some Saturn from Fab Filter with the low band and the high band actually turned off. And so we're just distorting the sort of like mid range band pretty heavily, bringing down the level and then sort of like bringing down the level to make it sort of like equal in volume and then just blending this in as much as we need it to sort of get that like fun mid range. Just using some fresh air from Slate for some excitement, messing around with the townhouse compressor from Brainworks just because I don't have as much experience with it and I wanted to try it. I mean, so far it sounds pretty fun and I like it. Just doing a tiny bit of compression, a little bit of EQ boost here. I try not to do anything above like a DB, but here I just kind of needed it. And then uh, just some L1. I probably should have used it different limiter but i was just uh building my chain around this and uh by the end of it i just didn't feel like changing it so yeah let's listen to what the entire track sounds like But yeah, that's what the track sounds like. If you guys enjoyed this video, please hit subscribe and all the bell icon and stuff like that. Again, I do one of these videos every Friday, so if you've watched this far, you've probably enjoyed this a bit. Leave any comments below about other indie pop stuff you would like me to look at or recreate and dissect. But uh, yeah, I hope you guys have a great week and I will see you guys next Friday.